know, basically I reject victimhood. Like, what does that mean? You know, because a lot of our kids are immersed in a world where everyone's telling them how oppressed they are. You're not a victim. In this classroom, that doesn't fly here. You have power. Pathways to power, like I chose that name explicitly. There are different ways, but the goal is power in your own life. Not power in power in terms of subjecting others, but power to make your life what you want it to be. I'm pleased to introduce my fellow conversant for this evening. Ian Rowe is the co-founder of Vertex Partnership Academies, a new network of character-based international baccalaureate high schools opening in the Bronx in 2022. And former CEO of Public Prep, a nonprofit network of charter schools based in the South Bronx and Lower East Side of Manhattan. He is also a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on education and upward mobility, family formation, and adoption. He is the chairman of the board of Spence Chapin, a nonprofit adoption services organization, the co founder of the National Summer School Initiative and an advisor of FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. He concurrently serves as a senior visiting fellow at the Woodson Center and writer for the 1776 Unites campaign. All around busy guy. Welcome, Ian. <laughs> Sam, how are you? Good to see you. I'm doing well. Good to see you as well. Yeah, I've been looking forward to, to, um, to this discussion. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, so... Basically, just to get started, if you can, for our audience who doesn't know what um, an international baccalaureate program is, can you just kick us off by explaining that program um, and why you chose it for your school in the or network in the South Bronx? Yeah, sure. And and let me just step back and once again, thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. It's um, Heterodox Academy, great organization. I've been inspired by a lot of the work that the organization has done. It's, it's allowed me to have more courage um, to be able to express myself because you, you recognize there are a lot more people who are yearning for more discussion and dialogue around contentious issues, but are often fearful to express themselves. Um, and I think that's why I have been looking forward to the conversation because I think we're hearing a lot um, about you know college campuses where you're seeing students, you know, not um, being accepting, you know, shouting down speakers. Just a couple of weeks ago at Yale Law School, which was, you know, honestly, I think it's an embarrassment for Yale, but they literally were having an event <laughs> focused on free speech to have a dialogue between um, two differing opinions, uh, people representing differing opinions, and 120 Yale Law School students were shouting, at, you know, primarily focused on one of the speakers, but it was staggering. It was staggering how this could be happening at one of the best law schools in the country. And, you know, you're just hearing this at graduate schools um, and at college campuses. But the thing is, like so much in uh, public education, it's not as if kids coming out of K to 12 are, you know, steeped in how to have dialogue across difference. Right. So it's not as if they're they come into college and suddenly they're, um, you know, they're shut down. A lot of this starts in high school. Um, and, you know, one of my colleagues at American Enterprise Institute, Sam Abrams and Sanda Balaban, who uh, created this great organization, uh, Next Gen Politics, has really been focusing on this question of at the high school level, are high school students feeling a sense of freedom in terms of expressing their opinion. And they wrote uh, this great essay a few months ago, and I'll just you know, quote, this is, this is their description of what's happening at high schools, particularly in New York City. They say that, quote, viewpoint diversity is not alive and well, and students often lack the ability to speak openly and question freely without worrying about repercussions. Politically correct speech codes have had a chilling effect on open discourse in many high schools, public and private in New York City. And they actually did a survey. Uh, I'm just uh, looking at the numbers here. They found that close to 60% of high school kids did not feel comfortable expressing their opinion on a subject because of their fear of how students, teachers, 
or the administration would respond. And I know FIRE um, uh, did a similar analysis at the college level. I think they all also was about 60%. So, so I have been very just interested in this question of, you know, if you were to build a high school, how would, in addition to everything else, upward mobility, academics, athletics, how you also create an environment where um, kids are able to express themselves um, and have debate and cite evidence. Um, so, that, so that's one sort of framing um, context for why we ultimately chose the IB program. The other piece is that uh, for the last 10 years, I was CEO of Public Prep, which is a network of uh, public charter schools, as you said, elementary through middle, middle school, so pre-K through eighth grade, all girls and all boys schools um, in the heart of the South Bronx and the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And it was amazing, you know, 2000 students in our network um, and, uh, you know, almost exclusively low income kids, uh, black and Hispanic kids who just their families wanted their shot at, an Ameri at the American dream. You know, we had nearly 5,000 kids on our wait list, you know, to give you a sense of the desperation that many families, particularly in these communities, have just to attend great schools. In fact, in 2015, in District 8 in the South Bronx, of the, of the 2,000 kids that went to the traditional um, high schools that started ninth grade, four years later, only 2% um, uh, passed what's called the advanced regents, which is essentially the equivalent of being college ready. But only 2% uh, essentially graduated from high school ready for college, meaning they started ninth grade and dropped out, or they did earn their high school diploma, but still could not do math nor reading without remediation if they went to college. Like that's just crazy. And there is not the ability to really open new schools. So, um, so the great news was that the State University of New York approved um, you know, public prep, our network that uh, went from you know, pre-K through eighth grade to extend their existing charter to go through 12th grade. And then another charter, Bria College Prep did the same. And so both now have created a joint high school program um, and they've now engaged Vertex Partnership Academies as a charter management organization to run their joint high school program. And so all of that is the setup to um, Vertex Partnership Academies. And I, I did put together a few slides and maybe it's a, a good point to launch them, but, but any comment before I just give a quick overview of the school, just based on anything I just said? No, I think we'll get into it when you show, you know, kind of yep. just getting into what International Baccalaureate offers, yep. Um, yep. as well as I know you'll talk a little bit about your cardinal virtues and why you yep. chose those as well. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. So can we, yeah, there we go. All right. Excellent. So so Vertex Partnership Academies, the entire school is organized around these ideas of equality of opportunity, individual dignity, and our common humanity. Um, you won't find a lot of the phrases you hear today about sort of group identity, racial equity. Um, we're much more focused on these as our anchored um, principles. Um, and we'll talk about why. Uh, let's go to the next stage, next, next slide. Oh, we, we, missed the, we missed the picture. There we go. <laughs> um, so this is our founding team. You know, I, no one can do any of this work alone. You know, building a school is a, is a, is a significant undertaking. So I just want to quickly uh, introduce that's Bill Stroud on the left. He's been uh, my partner since the very beginning. Bill was actually the founder of the Baccalaureate School for Global Education in Queens which is perennially ranked as one of the best high schools in the country. It is an international baccalaureate um, uh, high school. Actually, I think they go grade seven through 12, but he founded that and ran that. So has brought an incredible wealth of knowledge of how to build a great IB high school. Uh, Joyanette Mangual, she's our founding principal. Um, a lot of great experience, uh, special ed, uh, uh, teacher, administrator, um, uh, knows the community, um, and is just a great, inspiring leader, both her personal story, professional story. Um, we 
very lucky to have uh, Joynette as our founding principal, uh, Leslie Portugal as our founding director of operations, also a ton of experience uh, working in operations in the charter school world, you know, and then there's me. <laughs> um, and we just, uh, Bob Smith has just joined our team, another great uh, international baccalaureate leader, and we're hiring teachers. We've, we've hired about 12 of our founding staff, just amazing uh, teachers um, ranging, obviously, in um, uh, uh, English literature, math, the arts, Mandarin, you know, Mandarin, Spanish, but we're building our founding team. So if there are folks out there that want to be part of an amazing uh, environment, we're opening this uh, um, August 1st will be the first day for teachers and August 22nd, the first day for um, students. All right, uh, next slide. Um, so yeah, so just quick, so the International Baccalaureate, so the IB program, I think many people know of it, Although you don't really see it in many low-income urban communities. I mean, IB is, is very visible around the world. You typically see it in higher-income communities, um, in many private schools. It's a world-class curriculum. The mission to develop its mission is to develop inquiring, knowledgeable, and caring young people who help to create a better and more peaceful world through intercultural understanding, understanding and respect. Um, the, the work that is done in an IB program, you know, we feel as the founding team, it's the best curricula in the world. Um, it stresses inquiry and questioning, um, evidence-based arguments, and, you know, we'll, we'll see how we do that. Um, there's a, so we, we are going through the authorization process to become an international baccalaureate school, you can't just, you know, you can't just become one yet. There's a process and it's very rigorous. We have to demonstrate how we're implementing our curricula, the training that we're doing, the way in which we're engaging our students. Um, so the way that um, the IB program has uh, something called the primary years, which is equivalent to our elementary, then something called the middle years program, which is equivalent to middle school, and then something called the diploma program. And then we're also doing something called careers. So the middle years program is grades nine and 10. And then at the end of 10th grade, our students will have the option of choosing either a diploma pathway or the careers pathway. The diploma pathway is, is, is both of these are very rigorous equal pathways. Diploma is more geared towards a college or university pathway, if that's what you want to do after um, four years of high school. The IB careers pathway is more geared towards earning an industry credential with labor market value. So for example, um, computer science will be one of our um, areas that we focus on this for this incoming class. Uh, we're also in discussions with the very early discussions with the Mayo Clinic um, to develop a course of study on phlebotomy so that at the end of four years of high school, if you want to get a job as a phlebotomist, that would be an option for you. Uh, construction slash architecture um, is another uh, pathway and we'll likely do something in media we haven't yet. Uh, decided yet. But the idea is a recognition that college for all, and I used to be a college for all guy, um, but the idea is that students should have choice within the high school experience. I mean, I, I, I myself um, am a student of um, K-12 to public schools in New York City, and I went to Brooklyn Tech um, High School, and at, in tech, you know, we had 14 different majors that you could choose from. So I chose electrical engineering in high school and it was amazing. You know, it really set me up. I then went to Cornell to study computer science, engineering. So the idea of embedding choice, and, and by the way, this is also connected to upward mobility, creating more avenues for prosperity. However, a student wants to do that. Um, the equality of opportunity, individual dignity, and the, yeah, the next slide, cardinal virtues. Um, so uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, one of the organizing uh, principles um, uh, is this idea of cardinal virtues, this idea that there are, you know, the Latin word cardo means hinge, um, and cardinal virtues are those what are called root virtues upon which all other standards of mor moral excellence depend. Um, each cardinal virtue is the intrinsic life habit that we're seeking to cultivate within each student. And the idea is that when these 
virtues are normed and practiced regularly, these individual based behaviors then form the collective basis of a good society or of a good school community. And so these four, courage, justice, wisdom, temperance, virtually everything else we want in our kids, resiliency, responsibility, you know, determination, stick to all in some ways come back to one or some combination of these four. So, so just to give you a sense of how we, like these are draft I statements. So courage, you know, I reject victimhood and bravely persevere to make progress, even in times of struggle. There are no victims in our school. No one's oppressed, no one's marginalized. You know, we're not taking on um, these identities of persecution, right? So the idea is how do we build this virtue, this idea that I have the, I have the ability to succeed, even in times of struggle, even in the face of barriers. Justice, I operate with a sense of fairness and recognize the inherent dignity of each individual. Again, this is important. You are not reduced to a singular identity based on your race, your class, your gender. It just seems that somehow we've gotten into this mode in our country where we're just lumping, lumping kids into these amorphous categories and then labeling them with certain characteristics. Sometimes it's oppressor, sometimes it's oppressed, sometimes it's marginalized, sometimes you're the marginalizer. And it's just, in, in our view, these labels, sometimes they seem to be intended to create unity, but they often turn out to be more divisive. So we want each student to be treated as uh, as a human being, um, with all the complexities of what it means to be a human being. Wisdom, sound judgments based on evidence and objective, universal truths passed on over generations. There are just some things that are true and that we should be courageous to say it, you know, biological sex. I mean, there, there, there are males and females. That's a true thing. Um, that's, that has nothing to do with gender identity, for example, but there are objective universal truths that we should not be scared to say. And we do our kids no um, favors by depriving them of the truth. And then temperance is self-control, self-regulation, seeking balance. This is, you know, strengthen my future well-being. This is all about having a future orientation in such a way that it moderates your present behavior today. Um, next slide. Um, this, is, this, this slide's a little hard to read. I, I won't go through it, but the International Baccalaureate Program has, through many years of implementation, they've developed what they call a learner profile. These are, these are the characteristics that they're trying to build within their students. And we've done a crosswalk between our four cardinal virtues and the, the 10 learner profiles. So as you can see, and I'm happy to share this afterwards with any viewers, but courage, um, as you can see here, uh, risk takers. Um, and again, there, there are a lot of similarities, this idea that you know, in, in an environment where you feel comfortable, there's a sense of belonging, you feel more comfortable to take risks. You can, you can do that academically, you can do it athletically. There are a lot of ways to show courage, a lot of ways to teach courage through literature, through our community service program. Um, so again, I won't go through detail, but this is how we kind of map the cardinal virtues overlay uh, into the IB learner profile. Next slide. Um, and, I, and, I'll, and uh, we'll, we'll skip this one. Um, one other thing that's really important, we don't often talk about, but environment really matters. So we're spending a lot of time actually on real estate to ensure that the, uh, the physical environment that we have kids in is unto itself inspiring and unto itself creating spaces that allows young people to think outside the box. So we're actually uh, just signed our lease for um, a Catholic school space that's been empty for 10 years. This is the Blessed Sacrament School in the Bronx. This is where Sonia Sotomayor, the US Supreme Court Justice, went to school and was the valedictorian, but it was shut down in uh, 2013. So we're taking it over, we're doing some renovations. You can go to the next slide. Um, you can see it's a pretty big, no, whoop, there, uh, next slide. Yeah, you can see it's a pretty big campus. We have a soccer field, parking, building. So we, we will have this entire K 
campus for two years. Uh, so our first couple of years, are, you know, we'll be on this campus and it'll be a great place uh, for our kids to go to school. And then we move into our permanent building. So next slide. So we're building a hundred thousand square foot um, facility. It's going to be spectacular. This is right on the Grand Concourse in the heart of the South Bronx. Um, you know, this is where the district where only 2% of kids are graduating from high school ready for college. And again, we're going to create a space that screams freedom of expression and creativity and I can do anything. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. You know, it's just going to be a great, great place uh, for our kids to go to school. So that's a part of it. So when we talk about things like upward mobility, look, if you're in a, a crappy school that's falling down and the facilities really are, you know, not good, it's really hard to get kids to be thinking differently about their own future because they don't think adults care about them. And so there's a lot to this question of like when you were talking about curriculum, and again, we'll talk about curriculum, but there are a lot of elements that determine if you can really build an environment that really drives a sense of upward mobility. So maybe with that, um, let, let, let's stop the slide and then we can, we can, um, we can chat. So hopefully that's a, a good um, sort of intro to what we're up to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> so what, so far, you know, you're in the process of developing, um, but how has the community responded so far? And also, are you seeing enthusiasm um, from teachers who would like to work with you at the school? Yeah, so it's very interesting. So, you know, there's a lot going on in K to 12 education these days. And um, as you know, there's a, there's a large movement around uh, DEI and anti-racist training. And, you know, in some instances, um, you know, maybe it's productive, but I, the uh, feedback I hear from a lot of teachers is that there's an increasing um, focus on sort of an orthodoxy or an ideology that you have to adopt. And if you don't adopt it, you're in some ways excommunicated. And so, um, you know, their practices in terms of professional development in some schools where literally um, teachers are being separated by race, um, you know, you know, all the white teachers, you know, you go over here, all the non-white teachers, you go over there, you know, because the white teachers, you know, you need to have a struggle session about, you know, your oppression and what you do about, do about that. And, and um, the non-white teachers, you know, it, it's just, it's just, again, it's this reductionist, um, uh, in my view, reductionist behavior, which I think is extremely unproductive for building a learning environment. Now, there are others that would hear what I said, which like, no, 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 you know, these things are important and must be done, which is why the power of choice is so important. And so what we're getting are teachers that are honestly really wanting to escape that environment. They don't want to treat their kids as just an avatar member of some marginalized group. They want to treat their kids as individuals and they want to deal with all the complexities of what, it, what the word identity really means. Um, and this idea of equality of opportunity versus equity, which more often than not these days is translated into equality of, of outcomes by group. So the teachers that are coming to us, we feel are thirsting for professional environments where they're allowed to disagree, <laughs> they can um, express themselves and not be fearful that they're going to be, um, you know, shut out. And then in terms of families, you know, again, it's especially in this area in the South Bronx, there are some good high schools, but the, but the vast majority of high schools aren't that good. I mean, the, the, the graduation rate, um, for the, I think the South Bronx as a whole is about 45, 50%. And then again, that doesn't equal the college ready rate. And then again, in district eight, you've got very low uh, college ready rate. So, you know, these are, these are parents who, you know, it's like my parents, when they came to this country in the late sixties, they wanted their kids to have a, a shot at the dream. And um, so the, the way the school is structured, it's so Bria and College Prep, who are the schools that receive the extensions of their charters, all of their eighth graders can automatically matriculate into the school. But we're also taking transfer students, meaning that any kid um, in the South Bronx can enter the lottery. And if, especially if they live in a housing project or um, uh, in a particular district, 
um, um, they can have a very good shot of getting in as well. So we're, you know, we're excited. The, the incoming class will be about 227 students um, for ninth grade. Over four years, we'll have about 930 students overall. Um, and we think, you know, we think it'll be a spectacular new educational opportunity for kids. And I think teachers want that. Parents want that. It won't be for everyone. As I say, you know, there are other schools that are doing different things and more power to them if that's what teachers want to do. But that's, you know, you won't be seeing a lot of the sort of, you know, um, equity based uh, training because we have no interest in group equity. You know, we want outstanding outcomes for all kids as individuals. Yeah, and so with the, um, you know, I can see, see the enthusiasm for the environment um, coming from parents. Obviously they're making a choice to send their um, child to your school. So they likely have gotten an idea of what's going on there ahead of time. <clears throat> so what about, with the environment of free expression, you know, that you want this, this to be a place of free expression. How do you ensure that teachers are coming in, not only embracing it, because they might embrace it, but it's often difficult to do. Yeah. So how do you ensure that, um, you know, constructive disagreement is something that's yeah. thriving in school? Yeah, well, first of all, it's a great question. And <laughs> second of all, we certainly don't have all the answers. Um, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is that even in our selection process of our faculty, we are trying to just do kind of checks for, you know, how do you um, deal with uh, contentious issues? So for example, I um, was asked by C-SPAN to debate uh, critical race theory with a uh, an education professor from Brandeis, Brandeis University. And, you know, we had a, a really, in my view, a really great hour long constructive discussion about our disagreement about critical race theory. And it was so good. We did a follow up um, debate and I've done some other debates, but that C-SPAN debate is now part of our interview process. So if you're interested in um, a job at Vertex, we ask you to watch it and critique it, come back, you know, you know what were the points that you thought were well made? Do you think you could facilitate this kind of discourse around this issue? How would you do that? Um, partly to just to send a signal that we're not about canceling ideas, right? I mean, I don't think it make, I disagree with many of the tenets of critical race theory, but I don't think the right answer is to ban it. You know, if you're, if you're, um, if you are addressing a bad idea, the answer is not to crush the idea, it's to offer a better idea, right? And, and so that, so we wanna model the kind of democratic discourse as adults and faculty that we ultimately want to see with our students. So in our selection process, that's one of the first places. Um, I also just did a, uh, a podcast discussion about the um, continuation or not of race-based affirmative action in higher education, given that in very, in all likelihood within the next 12 months, the Supreme Court will rule race-based affirmative action unconstitutional. And the Harvard case that they're gonna be using, it's pretty overwhelming evidence that Harvard discriminated uh, in favor of black students over Asian students. I mean, it's very hard to look at the data and not walk away with that conclusion. And in this debate, I argued, that you know, race-based affirmative action may have had its benefits. There's some drawbacks, but there's certainly a large number of, of, of um, students of color in college today, and maybe now it's time to shift, like declare victory and now shift to class-based. If you're gonna have affirmative action, make it based on economics. And you know, the person who was debating me had a differing point of view. But again, the idea is let's have that discussion. Um, if we don't have the ability to have dialogue, evidence-based dialogue, um, not only have we lost our schools, you know, in the sense we've already we've lost our, our country. So those are some of the ways we're trying to, um, uh, on the front end, to your point, once we're started, then that's where the international baccalaureate training really comes in. A lot of the curriculum is, it almost forces you to, um, even in your assignments to students, you have to have a range of 
of um, sources when um, you're presenting data and evidence. So almost every exercise makes it almost impossible to only look at an issue through one vantage point. And so a lot of that's training um, and sort of leveling uh, how um, assessments are done. So again, this, this is an area, you know, I'm sure some of your listeners have great ideas. We, we'd welcome them. Um, but I think the general posture in an IB type school is that we're always learning how to do this. And so we're gonna experiment and um, take some risks, but we want people who just wanna be in this environment and want to model the behavior that we want kids to follow. Yeah, it sounds like a rigorous process, one, to uh, work for your school. And I'm sure a lot of teachers have not encountered that before, but it also sounds really exciting, like a place where you'd want to work, where ideas are flowing. Um, and That's our hope. Kids are engaged. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, the, the, I think the thing is, how do you operationalize it? You know, I'm sure a lot of folks starting a school say, yeah, our school's great and your ideas are flowing. It's just how do you truly make that happen? And you know, do you have courage and justice and wisdom and temperance? Like, are there a set of anchored values that you keep coming back to? So like when I was running um, public prep, one of the great rituals that we had was that every two weeks, so the, the four core virtues um, in that network were responsibility, merit, scholarship, and either brotherhood or sisterhood, depending on whether it was the all girls or all boys school. But every two weeks in, on each of our campuses, the entire student body came together with families. And so there was a core virtue that was the focus of a given. So you might have a class that takes responsibility to say, here's how we have demonstrated scholarship over the last week. And they had a whole assembly. And it's just, what are the ways that you keep these ideas living and thriving and actually being implemented in action? So those are the things we, you know, we're, we're talking about a lot. Like, what are our rituals? Um, and uh, well, I'll, 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 I'll share later one I'm thinking about, which I think could be kind of, kind of fun. It's kind of a, a throwback to about 100 years ago, but it could be interesting. Okay, fascinating. Now I know, you know, keeping in mind that this is a school of choice, so parents are choosing to send their kids there, but when it comes to the idea of virtues, and then I know in other venues, you've talked about the importance of discussing family and religion. Um, some would argue those are the roles of parents, not schools. Um, have you encountered any of that pushback or how would you respond to people who, yeah. who share that sentiment? Well, first of all, parents should be talking about uh, family, religion, faith. So we, we never want to step on the toes of, of um, parents. And in fact, I actually think there is kind of, um, and you know, we've talked a lot about it in the last year, this has been kind of a dangerous precedent that schools are sort of overstepping their bounds and saying, well, schools, I mean, there are schools that literally will withhold information from parents about their kid. And that is not cool. That's just not cool. You know, you have to figure out a way to bring parents into the equation. Um, the reason I spend a lot of time talking about the importance of family, uh, the timing of family formation, is that the data, like when we talk about upward mobility, you know, we, we can do all sorts of analysis about um, different uh, factors that drive intergenerational success. But one of the number one factors is the, the, the stability, the structure and stability of the family within which you were raised. And so let me give you one example. Um, there, there's often discussion about the racial wealth gap, right? If you look at the 2019 survey of consumer finances, which is a, you know, a pretty robust report, which many people use to get a sense of what's the median wealth of most Americans. So the, the median wealth of the average white family in 2019 was about $160,000 more than the median wealth of the average black family. That's a huge difference, right? And, and, and with no other inputs, you'd say, oh my God, that's terrible. That, and for some people, that's proof of America's history of racial oppression, 
contemporary racial oppression and that that gap is so big that there's nothing an individual person can do, which is why only massive government intervention or like a reparations program uh, is the only way you can solve the problem, right? And yet, if you look at that same data, the same 2019 survey of consumer finances and just take into account two factors, education and family structure, the median wealth of a college-educated married Black family is about $220,000 absolute. Turns out it's about $160,000 more than the median wealth of the average white single parent family. The point being that literally, so that racial wealth gap is literally reversed when you take into account these other factors. The reason that's important is that if you keep sending the message to young kids, particularly kids of color, who are in low income communities that, you know, it's, 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 it, the system's against you because of your race, it, it, it you know, is you're just systemically, you know, it's, you're just systemically going to be, you know, crushed basically, you know, after a while people start to believe that. And we want to send a different message. We just want to be honest. And so there's data, which is often referred to as the success sequence, which is basically data, which says, if you finish just your high school degree, um, then get a full-time job of any kind, just so you learn the dignity and discipline of work. And then if you have children, marriage first, 97% of millennials avoid poverty, right? It's not a guarantee. And so we'll, we'll have a class within Vertex called Pathways to Power, which this will be a thread within that class because Pathways to Power is what it literally sounds like. It's what are the pathways to you leading a self-determined life? And so it's not, it's, not, um, it's not taught in a prescriptive fashion, it's taught in a descriptive fashion. So the idea being, well, you're about to, you know, in, in the next eight years of your life, you're gonna be making some pretty big decisions about your education, your work, the relationships. You should know that if you make this series of decisions, these are the economic probabilities associated with this series. And with this series of decisions, these are the economic probabilities associated with that series, right? And so the whole idea being ultimately, you are the architect of your own life. But we as the adults have the obligation to share information about those approaches that have led to success or not. But you've got to decide. And, and we've had enormous pushback from some people who think, oh, you can't do that, you're moralizing, you're gonna embarrass kids who maybe their parents didn't follow these paths in their own lives. And so one of the things, and, and that's a fair concern. So one of the things we're going to do is to likely have, before we say all this to kids, actually have a class with parents to say, you chose our school because you thought that we would provide the kind of education. I found this on the web. Whoops, <laughs> sorry. That is that is like AI working right there. Um, you you uh, you chose our school because you thought that we would teach your kids not only about math and science and Mandarin and foreign language, but you also um, were trusting you to, to share the kinds of decisions that more likely lead to economic success. And when we did that, um, anecdotally, the parents, particularly parents who had not followed these steps in their own lives said, thank heaven someone is teaching my kid about these things because I wish that had been done in, in, um, for me when I was younger. So it's controversial. Uh, you, know, I, you know, it's interesting. It's controversial. I don't really think it's, I, I think honestly we'd be irresponsible as adults, particularly at the high school level, not to let kids know about these kinds of choices. Yeah, so that kind of gets us into some of the audience questions, like how, you know, you have curriculum and you have assessments, but a course like Pathways to Power, how do you determine if a course like that or your model in general is successful? Like what will be your indicators? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yes. Um, uh, and we're actually in, in, in conversations with uh, Johns Hopkins to actually set up a research um, structure from the very beginning. So, you know, what, what are the indicators? And, you know, they're the logical things, you know, 
high school graduation. In New York, it's, you know, are our kids passing the regents, you know, and there are a whole bunch of IB assessments that we'll, we'll clearly choose. Um, you know, we're also interested uh, in um, the pathways that our students will choose. So, you know, I said, we'll have either the IB diploma or the IB careers. One is we're not even quite sure yet uh, how many kids will be um, choosing which mm -hmm. pathways. Mm -hmm. So it's why we're thinking actually in the in our sophomore year to actually have some opportunities for either mini apprenticeships or 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 a couple of day long or week long experiences where kids can actually be doing. Um, an exercise in a potential career pathway that they may have no idea and that might lead them. Because I think one of the big issues is that kids may not choose things that they're not, you know, they just have, mm -hmm. they just have no idea, right? So um, so part of it is, is how do we help kids know just the bevy of opportunities that exist? So that's something we're thinking about a lot um, in ninth and 10th grades before they hit the diploma um, and the careers pathway. And obviously over time, you know, we'll measure things like college persistence for those kids that do choose to go. There are also some non-academic outcomes like, you know, are kids um, making healthy choices in their personal lives? And that's a bit harder to measure. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's those kind of logical things in terms of like, how do you measure whether or not you actually have an environment of democratic discourse? That's actually harder. Um, the, the things that matter are not always easily measurable. And that's something we have to live with. Um, I would certainly welcome ideas from, um, from the audience on how you measure things like you know, have you really created a culture of viewpoint diversity? Um, I mean, I think we'll know. Um, you know, obviously you do things like survey of your teachers and what do they value? So we'll be doing a lot of those kinds of things. Um, but, uh, you know, fundamentally, again, I think we're going into this with the idea of strong values, strong curriculum with the IB program. And again, we're hoping to be authorized. Um, but also are willing to take risks and experiment and to change and to have a staff that's ready to roll with us to do that. Yeah, I always think about how longitudinal studies are really the things that we need, especially for upward mobility. You know, it's, it's hard, <coughs> excuse me, it's hard to see what that looks like when the students are in front of your face. Um, yeah. You know, you need to know did they go to college? Did they graduate? Or did they choose a career path that led them in yeah. that direction? I mean, the for, for public prep, the network I used to lead, the, the first students started in 2005. They're all girl, the girls prep Lower East Side. That was the flagship school. They started in kindergarten and first grade. And so last, uh, two years ago now was the first year that that cohort graduated from college, you mm. know? which was pretty amazing. And, you know, great schools like Howard, Yale, um, Tufts, some really wonderful um, universities. But yeah, it's really hard to know. And frankly, some of those, some of those girls, if you were to look back when they were like in sixth grade, you could never imagine that they were now walking um, across the aisle uh, getting their um, college degree. But um, yeah, so the longitudinal studies are important, and that's why that's why we're we're setting something up. Um, we were hoping to lock that in with Johns Hopkins, so that we know that um, you know what are the ingredients that we're doing early on, what are the things that we will shift, and then how do we track this over time? Yeah, so we had a question that's a similar point when it comes to upward mobility. It's do you believe that educational institutions, K through twelve, higher ed, etc measure upward mobility in a meaningful way that can inform public policy? Are there objective indicators of upward mobility that we aren't currently measuring that we should incorporate into our assessments of educational institutions? Are there other indicators that are widely used but not particularly informative? Wow, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, it, it is, it is uh, the case that for many of us, who are in the world of trying to, you know, create greater prosperity, 
oftentimes you're looking at things like the racial wealth gap or incarceration rates or healthcare, or, you know, lack of healthcare or homelessness or criminal activity. Like you're looking at all these outcomes as adults and we're all trying to solve these problems. And look, we have to do that because it's never too late to help um, individuals. But if like, for example, going back to district eight, if only 2% of kids are graduating effectively um, from high school ready for college, why would we think that years later, they're gonna be thriving in employment or all these other areas? So it's a good question as to what should we be measuring um, coming out of high school? Because certainly high school graduation rates are not the thing. And there's a lot of evidence that high school graduation rates are inflated. The, the, again, the differences between college readiness versus high school graduation, deep, you know, deep gaps um, between those two. Um, so, you know, for us, it, it'll be the, for us, it'll be the assessments because we're going to be the IB assessment. We, we do believe represent a significant level of rigor and IB has an incredible track record of college completion rates. Like in, in those instances, where IB has actually been implemented in um, urban settings. There's a great study done in Chicago um, where incredibly high college completion rates for students. So for us, we're gonna be leaning heavily um, on those kind of uh, metrics. I mean, I'll, I'll give you one example of how we are thinking about um, this idea of upward mobility and how uh, young people can see themselves as owners and entrepreneurs. So there's a Charles Schwab company has uh, has a has an initiative uh, called their uh, their stock slices program. Um, it allows you to to basically have a fractional share of an S and P 500 company. So for five dollars, you can be an owner of Apple uh, or Walmart or Google. And so every ninth grader that starts at Vertex Partnership Academies will actually have a stock portfolio of 10 S&P 500 stocks. It'll be $50 that we're raising through private philanthropy, but every kid will have a portfolio. So they, you know, so if they have an iPhone, they will not just be a consumer, they'll actually be an owner. Like, what does that actually mean to own Apple? You know, and and to see your portfolio increase in value every three months. And why is it that your earnings are going up and mine are going down? Or why is it that your companies are, are providing dividends and, and others are not? It's one small piece of a whole bunch of different strategies that we're going to be deploying. So again, this isn't how you measure upward mobility, but these are the little things that we think in some ways are normed in middle and upper class communities, you know, kids who get, you know, stocks or bonds. Um, and it's just, it's just part of the, it's in the water, you know? And for a lot of low income kids, it's not an exposure. When, when, um, when I was running, you know, public prep, the, the, the biggest checks I love to write were the checks where we were matching and even going above the matches for the New York State 529 college savings accounts that we help start for each of our kids starting in pre-K. Because the whole idea is we wanted not only the kid, like the kid would have on their, you know, on their account, their name, their college savings account at four years old or five years old. Cause that helps to build this idea of a future orientation. Like there's this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow helps to regulate my behavior today. So, so it's as much thinking about what are the metrics for how we indicate um, whether upward mobility is happening. But it's also to think about what are the practices, what are the rituals that help young people to think about this idea of entrepreneurship, ownership? How do I, you know, how do I architect my own destiny uh, economically? And so, you know, those are some of the things that we, again, try to operationalize these things around what upward mobility really means. Yeah, so um, on this topic, one audience member asked, how does a push for upward mobility avoid charges of fueling elitism? Wow. Wow. I'd love to speak to this person. 
Because the, the, the assumption is upward mobility equals being elite or being privileged? Um, well, I guess like it, it's related to what you were just discussing, because I'm thinking of, you know, you're talking about what kids from middle and upper class families kind of just by the nature of being are exposed to these things. Yep. And so I think the participant wants to know, obviously not directly related to your comment, but how do you avoid fueling elitism? So if you think about the upper class as being elitist, I, you know, I don't want to put words in the audience member's mouth, but um, the competition to get to the upper echelons, how do you avoid? Right. Wow. That's, a, that's a, Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. I mean, I guess I don't start with the premise that if you're in the upper or, you know, upper or middle class that you're necessarily elitist in the sense of, you know, I got mine and, you know, screw everybody else um, because we're trying to develop whole individuals who are very empathetic um, for their community, the global situation. But we also want, you know, and we want them to understand how the world works and how they build wealth. There's, there's nothing incongruent about that. And sometimes even the idea of the word privilege, you know, I want my kids to be privileged. I, I want our kids to have choices and yet know that they play a role in larger society um, to be as concerned with those who have not yet had, um, you know, had their chance to succeed. Um, so, I mean, maybe you're, maybe you're, sorry, I'm running out of battery, but there, I just solved that problem. Um, you know, maybe you're, um, the viewer is saying it's inevitable that, so I, I guess maybe we will be accused of elitism, but, you know, I want my kids to have ownership in Apple at 14 years old. So, they can know that an entrepreneur named Steve Jobs built this company that has transformed the world in positive ways and bad, um, and yet built an organization. And to understand the economic side of that, I don't know if that's elitism, that's just like understanding how the world works. I mean, honestly, I don't know how my founding, I don't know how my partner <laughs> founders feel about this, but I want my kids to have, you know, our, our students to have, um, you know, subscription to the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, like, uh, you know, we, we should just be in the rhythm of having our kids reading, consuming multiple um, viewpoints. Um, uh, is that elitism? Or is that, is that, you know, the next generation, we want to be informed so that when they get to college, they are not feeling that if they hear an idea that's counter to what they believe, they feel they have to shout it down, you know, and somehow have a, a predisposition against the elite. Like, yeah. You know, I just, I just, again, these labels, I think, get in the way of our human progress together. Yes, well put. So, Going back to, you know, kind of started that answer with, well, you're educating the whole child. So it's not just about, you know, getting to a certain economic standing. You want them to be, you know, good individuals, contributing members of society. So how does this curriculum, um, International Baccalaureate, as well as, you know, the Cardinal Virtues, sell itself as having use value to students? How do students understand courage or other virtues as a practical and philosophical concept? Oh, good, great question. So first thing is um, you can't create this environment for kids until you've also created the same environment for adults. And so I'll, I'll start this answer by saying what we're doing with our faculty who are coming in. So as I talked about the selection, we'll be asking people to, you know, to view some of these um, debates on contentious issues and gives their feedback on how they think they would facilitate that in their own classrooms. But so we have, uh, there'll be three weeks of professional development to start and then there's ongoing development throughout the year. But so year, week one is a lot about what is IB, you know, what are our cardinal virtues? How does that map to the learner profile? All of that. But then week two, we are going to be doing the Good Society which is a week-long seminar that's actually been done by the Aspen Institute. So I, I was a Pahara Aspen Fellow, um, which is a great, uh, great um, 
um, experience where one of the weeks is dedicated to reading some incredible works, philosophers, um, you know, thousands of years old, um, for what it means to create the set of norms between each other. Like if we are creating this community together, how do we define what is socially acceptable or not? And it was honestly, for me, it was like one of the most um, professionally transformative events I've had. Um, and this was back in 2018. So we're gonna be doing that with our teachers. Um, and some of our founders are gonna be doing the Good Society themselves seminar to go through it themselves, to experience it, what it means, how do you facilitate this? But it's, it's a great way to sit down with a group of people for a week, you know, and everything is private and confidential. And you read some of the greatest works of all time. Um, and, and even that, you know, there's some, there's diversity in the, in the, in the, the books that are read and the passages that are read. Um, and you learn how to create a society. And, you know, some, some of it's pretty tough because you deal with contemporary issues, you deal with historical issues, but you, you confront humanity. And, and, uh, and so it's, it's, so it's a very, it's going to be a very part, powerful part of our professional development. Uh, and then as the teachers then do that, they will then be able to turn key with students to say, if we're going to have a community in our classroom grounded around courage, justice, wisdom, temperance, what does that mean to us? Right. That those I statements, you know, courage, like, you know, basically I reject victimhood. Like, what does that mean? You know, because a lot of our kids are immersed in a world where everyone's telling them how oppressed they are. You're not a victim. In this classroom, that doesn't fly here. You have power. Pathways to power, like I chose that name explicitly. There are different ways, but the goal is power in your own life. Not power in power in terms of subjecting others, but power to make your life what you want it to be. So again, it's a little ethereal, but we're creating these structures to be able to have an open dialogue where our faculty has gone through this, these experiences themselves, where we've created these norms with each other. And now we want to model that for our kids. And, you know, we think it's going to be exciting, um, you know, even down to classroom layout, you know, we're probably going to have flexible furniture that allows the Socratic method where kids are talking to each other as opposed to, you know, you know, sage on the stage or whatever that, you know, phrases where one teacher in front of lined up rows, but we want to find all those ways to facilitate dialogue, discourse, interaction, um, disagreement and, and debate. And um, so, th so those are the ways we're um, trying to create the environment, both for our kids as well as faculty. Yeah, and on that note, you know, students obviously aren't existing in a vacuum. So <clears throat> they're part of the larger world outside the school that they attend. Um, so one audience member said, you know, humans are emotional, kids especially so. How does a school environment help to manage difficult moments or incursions of group identity dynamics? Incursions of group identity <laughs> dynamics. Yeah, that, that's probably something we're going to have to deal with because it. It's impossible not even as much as I say, we want everyone to be an individual and we're going to try very hard not to fall prey to, you know, you've got the BIPOC community, you've got the LGBTQ community, you know, you've got all these labeled groups and suddenly you've got a whole bunch of divisions within your school. And I think, honestly, this is just a lot of conversation about with our teachers and how do we treat our kids as individuals in such a way that we're not elevating any singular characteristic to be the most important thing about you. Because that's what I feel we've gotten into. Like suddenly you're black and therefore that means X, right? Or you're white or you're gay or you're this or you're that. And that comes along with all this baggage. And I, and I just think that's part of why we're trying to bring together a faculty that recognizes equality of opportunity, individual dignity, and respect for our common humanity. Those aren't just words for us. You know, we, we are gonna try and live it out and we want to attract families and faculty who want to operate 
in that environment. You know, so it's it's a little bit of a dodge because the, the person's question is, what do you do when, you know, you have some incident where, you know, let's say a black kid gets attacked and it's, you know, let's say some incident occurs where it's a it's a black student and a white police officer, you know, just making it up and suddenly that becomes a thing. Honestly, I think the importance of your cardinal virtues, your core principles, that's what you lean on in those times. You know, that that's what you actually go back to. You know, you 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 don't abandon your core focus on individual virtues when you're struck with a situation where everyone only wants to define a whole group of people in one way. Like we don't, we that's not the way we operate. So I, I think the test will be when those inevitable moments occur to go back to things like our core purpose of being. Yeah, and in a similar vein, but also kind of on the flip side, so how do you balance this idea of not being a victim? So, you know, you're trying as hard as you can to focus on the individual and their strengths while also acknowledging any sort of um, systemic disadvantages that exist. Yeah. Well, this is, again, this is an interesting question. I, you know, I do obviously running schools for 10 years and now developing um, Vertex. And, you know, I do think young people are trapped between what I call these two dominant narratives. Um, the first I call blame the system, as you just described, and the other I call blame the victim. Um, and in the blame the system narrative, that's the, you know, America is this permanently oppressive nation that based on your race, your class, your gender, your gender identity, like the systems are just rigged against you, right? You're just, you're just screwed. Like the, 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 there's a white supremacist lurking on every corner. Um, you know, it's just America from its very inception has been grounded in slavery. It's a slavocracy. It's not a democracy. And, and the only answer is um, massive government intervention or massive societal transformation. And uh and, and you're kind of helpless um, unless one of those things happens. So that's what I call blame the system. But on the other side, I call blame the victim, which is the, the opposite narrative, which is that America is great. You know, America is this land of opportunity. There's, you know, there's, there's ways for you to be successful everywhere. And if you're not successful, it's your fault, right? It's some pathology that you have you should have pulled yourself up by the bootstraps, right? It's like you're responsible for whatever, you know, bad situation that you're in. So this blame the victim and blame the system, I honestly, I think they're both half truths that add up to a lie. And they are immobilizing for young people, right? Because they rob young people of this idea of agency that you have the ability to determine your own destiny. Um, and so... I do believe that young people need a new framework to know that they're not victims, that they know they have the capacity to overcome institutional barriers that the blame the system people say are insurmountable, mm -hmm. while also knowing that there are institutions that can support them, like Vertex, um, that will, kind, will provide the kinds of supports that kids need that the blame the victim people constantly ignore, right? So that, and, and that, you know, I've just written a new book called Agency and it's coming out May 16th where, where I set up this dynamic um, where I put forth a new framework that I call free, family, religion, education, entrepreneurship, that I do think that those are four pillars that young people, if they were to embrace, will have a much greater likelihood of not only not being a victim, but being an architect of their own um, destiny, where family is the first anchor and it's related to the success sequence. It's not about the family that you're from, it's about the family that you form. And that's why that data is so important. R for religion talks about the importance of a faith commitment. There's a ton of data. You, your viewers might know that there's a great book that just came out. Um, it's called God, Grades and Graduation, mm -hmm. which talks about how the importance of a faith commitment actually increases academic outcomes. The th E for education is all about school choice. And you know, those 5,000 kids on the wait list in the South Bronx should have choices. 
um, because it, it's anchored. And if you have family, religion, education, the last E is entrepreneurship, which is all about ownership, building wealth, work. So it's a framework that I put forth. But yeah, this idea of you're not a victim. I know you're hearing it all day. You're hearing it how marginalized you are. You're hearing how oppressed you are. And it's not that it's not that you're going with blinders on. It's just saying, well, guess what? There are actually people that look like you, that come from situations like you, and not just like a couple, millions of people who face the same exact situations. How do they do that? Is it all just random? Or are there patterns of behavior that's wisdom that has been learned over time that you as a young person need to know? Well, we're going to teach that to you. So that's how we, you know, we, we you're not a victim. You're not a victim. You have power. And sometimes I think kids need to hear, I think adults need to hear it. Some of these mm -hmm. adults who seem to be so like, oh my God, I care so much about these kids, these oppressed kids. I think they don't, they don't realize how much they're reifying the very stereotypes that they claim to be fighting against. Yeah, I often find myself wanting to blame the adults in the room, not so much uh, the kids. Um, so it's just to go back to your discussion of the book on God grades and graduation. I just want to plug that we have an event with the author next Thursday. Oh. Um, and just to close out, so you've, you know, kind of laid out your framework, given us an understanding of what your school looks like, why you've chosen to develop the model in the way that you have. So as a closeout question, um, what things have you learned from this process that could be exported to traditional public schools? Great question. Everything. That's, you know, so, you know, I run charter schools and to some degree, you know, we're a special model within the larger public school apparatus. And we do have certain freedoms, right? We do have the ability to hire our own teachers, to fire our own teachers, to compensate them at levels that we think are competitive. We do have the ability to, to um, have our own curriculum. So there are freedoms, you know, we're, at, we're out there figuring out how to finance buildings. And so there are things that we're doing that are special and unique that we think will be incredible as it relates to providing an, a world-class education for our kids. But it's a lot of it comes back to mindset. Uh, you know, I know some amazing school leaders within traditional public schools that are working within their constraints of union rules and all sorts of things and still creating great environments for kids. And so I think it starts there. I think it starts with what are the core principles um, that you're, that you're, you're going to have fidelity to? Like we've chosen the four cardinal virtues, you know, courage, justice, wisdom, temperance. And then we've mapped that to the International Baccalaureate Program. They're 10 learner profiles. And we think if we keep coming back to those as the anchor, we're going to do some special things for kids. Um, about 100 years ago, Booker T. Washington, who, you know, amazing Black leader who founded the Tuskegee Institute, he had a series of lectures every Sunday night. He did, he did about 40 of these. And there are these amazing lectures about character, how to, how to build character. Um, and they've now been put into book form. And so I'm thinking I might every week read one of his lectures that he said a hundred years ago about what it meant to be responsible, to have resiliency, to have courage, to, to pick yourself up when you don't succeed. Like these amazing lectures are like between five to 10 minutes and anyone could do that. That, 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 that's not because I'm in a charter school or even an IB, but it's an example of the kind of thinking that allows you, you know, to do something kind of cool, right? Um, and also just this bring something special to your kids. It's like wisdom, courage, justice, wisdom, temperance. There's a lot of wisdom out there. We don't have to reach out, you know, recreate the wheel. So I think a lot of what we're doing could be transferred. It starts with mindset, leadership, getting a team that doesn't, you know, um, isn't fearful of challenging an orthodoxy, especially if 
it means better outcomes for kids. Like we are, we are putting forth our own ideology, our cardinal virtues. One could say we're trying to indoctrinate kids into that. So to some degree, yeah, we're guilty of that. But we, we believe these are universal and timeless ideas and virtues. That's wisdom. And we want all of our kids to have access to that. Wow, that is a great note to end on. Um, you know, we can tell that you've definitely put a lot of thought into the type of school you want to create. And I certainly personally uh, wish you the best of luck in that endeavor. And we'll be excited to hear how it goes. And, you know, you reporting back to us to let us yes. know how it's all worked out. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having this. And honestly, thank you for heterodox because you are often a voice of reason. Um, it's amazing. Um, and the courage that you and your founders have shown over the years, whether you know it or not, has, has given a lot of um, wind beneath the wings for a lot of folk who are fighting in the trenches um, to, bring, to put your principles into action. Well, thank you for saying that. We really appreciate it. Um, and we're glad to keep doing this work and moving forward alongside people like you. So thank you for giving us your time this evening and thank you to the audience members for joining us. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you. 